Hey, thanks for joining us today. Here in our channel, you can catch all of our messages and live services. And our hope is that you would experience the presence of God in a very real and tangible way. That's right. And if you want to make sure that you never miss a message again, all you need to do is hit the subscribe button below this video. And uh, today is Palm Sunday. Yep. And you know what Palm Sunday means? It has multiple meanings for the Lowry household. Um, the first meaning, very unspiritual, is that this Palm Sunday is always the beginning of our excuse of a week of feasting on Reister bunnies, Reister eggs, <laughs> Reister kebabs, Reister soup, <laughs> Reister whatever. Just throw some peanut butter and chocolate in it, baby. And uh, uh, thank you, Jesus, for walking, uh, riding that donkey. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's very spiritual, I know. Boy, we just made a hard, hard pivot, didn't we? <laughs> Come Holy Spirit, overcome our battles. Let's hear it for Reister bunnies. Um, sorry, welcome to my life. Um, but, but, you know, that, but in seriousness, this Palm Sunday, if you're not familiar, this kicks off what we call Holy Week. This is the moment where this celebrates a week before Jesus was arrested and crucified that, that he... Uh, rode in on Jerusalem on a donkey to fulfill prophetic uh, uh, prophecies from Isaiah and other Old Testament prophets of prophesying about the Messiah, and he was fulfilling every single prophecy that was ever prophesied about him. And as he was riding in, they call it Palm Sunday because they threw down the the crowd threw down clothes and palm branches on the road so that the donkey, as a so, sign of respect and uh, a sign of royalty. And this was their, their moment of announcing the Savior of the world has come. That, that ultimately this moment is where everybody isn't just who is this man. He just healed somebody. Or he, this guy does miracles. Or hey we know John the Baptist but who is this Jesus guy. And this is where it is now pivoting in the audience and in the crowd and in the people from going, who is this Jesus? He is a miracle worker. Now he is being declared the savior of the world, the Messiah coming to earth for his people. So, so there is this, so understand in this moment what's happening. And we're going to revisit the Palm Sunday piece of this in a moment. But I want, to, I want to tie this in as we wrap up our series on what on earth am I here for. And, and this entire series has been wrapped around the fact that throughout the Bible, there are five, everybody say five. five. Are you guys awake this morning? Yeah. All right, good, because I know the rain kind of like brings it down a little bit, but ain't no excuse. So, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what else to say. It's, it's just no excuse. Anyway, so there's these five callings or purposes or visions, or different terminologies used, but there are five purposes that, that the Bible gives us of why we are here on this earth. What on earth am I here for? So number one was to be loved. Very good. So this one is like the fundamental, right? This is the foundation. If we don't get this, you do not pass go. You know, this is the, this is the part of being loved by God the, 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 this is what scripture tells us to grow our roots down into. This is, you know, the, the, you don't grow your roots down into God's power. You don't ro grow your roots down into God's presence. You don't, grow, grow, you don't grow your roots down into God's scripture. It's, all of those are awesome pieces of once we grow our roots into God's love is what scripture tells us. So that's number one. Number two is that we Belong, very good. You guys are cheating. You belong. It's all right. They, they need help, Caleb. Okay, keep it going. Uh, so be loved. Number two is belong, that you're called to belong to God's family, that we're not, we are not wired. We are not made. It doesn't matter how introverted you think you are. There is no person that is wired to be totally alone, that, that you're never called. You're not created to be a lone ranger. God himself decided to be a trinity, to be three in one, because there is an example of fellowship that is so important 
that he wanted to set that example for us as well. The most complete, perfect being in the world decided to be three to show that nobody's supposed to go it alone. So we find meaning in our purpose in our relationships with each other. So be loved, be long. Number three is to become. Everybody say become. So I want you to hear this. In a world that says you can be whatever you want, you can be whoever you want, you can be whatever gender you want, you can love whoever you want. In a world that says you want it, who are we to judge you? The message and the invitation of the kingdom is not to become more like ourselves, it's to become more like Jesus. And this is so important to understand, and this is why the church can never blend in and start sounding like the world in this area, because the call of the kingdom is not to become more like ourselves, or to become more like so-and-so who's, the, who's an Instagram influencer, or super pastor, or super Christian, or, or super non-Christian, or the, or the angry Christian that hates church, whatever. It, the, the call is not to become more like the world or more like ourselves. Why are we not called to be more like ourselves? Is because we're evil. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're evil. That was a little weak. I thought you guys were going to take up the opportunity. I, I expected some wives to really belt that one out. <laughs> You're like, oh, don't worry. When he gets in here, I'll tell him. No, we have a sinful nature, right? And without Christ, if we do not become more like Christ, then becoming more like ourselves is a perpetual pitfall. It will never end of this downward spiral and usually salvation comes whenever people are into this perpetual spiral and when they finally hit a bottom of going this is unfulfilling boy this was fun for a moment but it is unfulfilling that's usually when people start to look that there's got to be something more to this life right so but 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 we we got to be careful as, as believers as Jesus followers not to fall back into that trap <laughs> Because we can start to go, yeah, man, look at that person. They look so happy on Facebook. They look so happy on Instagram or TikTok, man. They, man, they're not following Jesus at all, but look at them. I mean, even King David in the Psalms, King David was like, God, why are my evil enemies prospering while I'm sitting here in this cave? I've loved you. I've served you. They, they're having so much fun. And God's like, you just wait, bro. <laughs> I got big things coming. All right, so anyways, that's not the point of the sermon. Become number four. So we beloved. We belong, we become, and we? We bless. <laughs> we, we are called to bless others. That growing our roots in God's love is that we start to connect with other believers. We are part of God's family. We become more like him. We start, and that is a lifelong process. And we bless others, that we don't just live our lives for ourselves. And I want you to understand something. We're not saying that we can't enjoy life or enjoy some of the finer things of life. Like, trust me, I like some of the finer things of life. Um, but if the finer things of life consume all your margin of your time, your money, your energy, and your talents, where there is no room to bless others, then it has become an idol. You know, if that boat that God blessed you with now all of a sudden consumes every Sunday and you can't go to church, it has become an idol. Right? Can I get an amen? Or was that an ouch? See, the thing is, is God blessed you with kids. Don't let them become such an idol that they keep you from becoming more like Jesus. And then if you have no margin to bless other people because of the blessing that God gave you, can I just invite you into creating margin in your life or parenting in a different way that you actually have margin in your life? Pastor Christina and I have been saying this summer, man, I think I would love to do a parenting series on how to raise kingdom-centered kids. Um, 
not that we're experts, but we've learned a few things of what to do and what not to do. Probably more of what not to do, but that's, but we'll share along. We'll share, we'll pass along whatever we know. So we're called to beloved, belong, become, bless. <laughs> it's good, I'm t- that's totally sticking. Whoever said that over here, Rob, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, I mean. And then number five is to be sent, is to be sent. And I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. If you're not taking notes, I want you to write this down anyways. Put it in the notes of your phone, text it to yourself, whatever. If you want to know the purpose of history, if you want to know what all of this is about, if you want to know the whole point of all of this, it's simply this. Write this down. God is gathering a family. This is what it's all about. The whole point of him creating all of the heavens and the earth and all the planets and the fish and the plants and creating an ecosystem upon which we could thrive. All of it, the reason that you were born is to, because God is gathering a family. A family that will love and live with him forever. I want you to read in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5. We visited this verse, I think, in week two. But it's, he says this, that God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. It gave him great pleasure by creating us, by adopting us into his family. Remember that God's whole purpose, his whole design, he created the heavens and the earth so that he could create us so that we could love him and we could be part of his family. That is the goal. That's it. That's the end game. That's it. He wants a family. He wants people that he can love. He wants people that can love him. And here's what we know about love is love cannot be coerced. I mean, how exciting is it if you literally have to program your spouse to say nothing but I love you and they don't know how to say anything else? How meaningful is that love when it's coerced? It's not at all. In fact, I wouldn't say it's love. Why? Because love, what makes love so amazing and what gives you the butterflies and all that stuff is the fact that that person is choosing to love you. And this is why God would never create a bunch of robots or puppets that just worship him with no choice. What is the fun of that? There's no meaning in that. But if God then has a family that says, I choose to worship you, God, and all the pleasures of the world and all the things that I could go after, I choose to go after you, God, now that makes him full of pride. And that makes him full of joy when his children say, Daddy, I love you. I want to follow you. You know, in fact, I hear this all the time. I've said this before, but I hear people always say, man, if God, how could a loving God, like, send people to hell? And I actually, I actually like to propose it a different way, is that all your life, you've told God you want a life without him, and he's just granting your wish. It's like, he didn't send you to hell, you chose it. You actually chose. You said, no, God, I don't want to be. I don't want you in my life. So he says, okay. All right. So you now have eternity without me. And and so so, so he's not going to make us love him. He may persuade us. There is persuasion. 
right? I mean, there are people who come into our lives in the moment that we need it the most to share the good news, the share of God's love that then says, yes, I want to choose this love, but never under co coercion, never under pr pressure or duress. See, the, the great thing is, is God loves the love that we choose for him. This is what he loves. But here's the crazy thing is, is God set it up in a way, he didn't set it up where he's the one telling everybody of his love. He already set up the demonstrations of his love. He, in scripture, it says that all of the trees, all of creation groans in worship to the Lord. So he's already set up everything that demonstrates his love for us. Now, here's the way he did it, is he set it up where the people that are in God's family now start to become the mouthpieces of his love for those who are not yet in his family. That's what he did. He set it up. He says, I'm not going to tell anybody else. I've already set up. I've given you all the tools. Now go. Now tell everybody else about how amazing this love really is. Someone has to pass on the good news. This is the way it says in Romans chapter 10. It says, for everyone... Everybody say everyone. everyone. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And this is it. And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? You know, there's a saying that, that, that actually has a lot of scholars debunk that St. Francis of Assisi actually never said it, but there was this quote going around when I was in my 20s, was like, everybody loved. It was like, as a witness at all times, and if necessary, use words, right? So we always loved that, and that was always our excuse to like never evangelize, really, is what it came down to. I'll just live my life and be nice, and hopefully somebody will figure out I'm a Christian. But instead, Look what Romans says, what Scripture says. Scripture actually never says that. Somebody said it. Somebody made it up and, made, and attributed it to St. Francis of Assisi. I don't know who did it. But, but the reality is, is that Scripture says, how can they hear unless someone tells them? So if we were to reverse engineer this Scripture, it would say, hey, church, go tell them. Because they're not going to hear it unless you do it. And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? This is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. Here's what's crazy. It didn't say, how beautiful are the ones who, who memorize scripture. It doesn't say, how beautiful are the feet of the ones who pray really spiritual prayers. Blessed are the ones who, so on and so on. And I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this because we kind of skip over this because it kind of freaks us out sometimes. Blessed are the feet, are the messengers of the good news. And church, I want you to be blessed. I want you to be blessed. And there's a lot of ways to be blessed. And we talk about a lot of things that scripture tells us and how we form and how we become and, and how we give. And, but, but like we can't miss this piece. We can't miss the being sent piece. That this is part of our call. That our fifth purpose is that I'm sent to bring others to God's family. That that is my fifth purpose is to be sent to bring others into God's family. The reality is, is the moment that I step across the spiritual line of salvation, I am now entering, as soon as I, I, I believe and I commit my life to follow Jesus and make him my Lord and Savior, there's a line of demarcation and I am now in God's family. And as soon as I enter into God's family, there is a call on my life, there is a purpose in my life to now share this good news with others. It is. This is this, it comes with being in the family. I mean, the moment. Now, think about it this way. If I had the cure for COVID, 
and I kept it a secret. I said, now, you know what, I'm just going to be really private about this. I'm an introvert. I don't want to be seen like a freak. I'm going to get raked over the coals on social media. People are going to say I'm a fake and a hypocrite. So, you know, I'm just going to keep this to myself. But boy, I sure am glad my family and we figured out the cure for COVID. If I was to keep that a secret, it would be, at the, at, at the very least, it would be cruel. And I would actually make an argument that it would be criminal. I mean, like, could you imagine... If you lived with COVID, you had people dying of COVID and found out that I had the cure. But because of my fear of what could be, I chose not to share it. You would not be very happy with me, <laughs> I would imagine. And the reality is, is God has given us an even greater message. God has given us a message of how to have our past forgiven how to walk in purpose in the present, and how to have a home in heaven in the future. He's given us this message, this good news, and what we do with it is everything. I mean, what we do with it if this really is the good news, if this really is the hope, if this really is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ that sets bondage, uh, chains, it breaks chains, it sets people free, it restores relationships, it gives purpose and hope and freedom. And if this really is the good news, then I would suspect that there would be a lot of Christian criminals that will not share this cure because of how we think of ourselves. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says it this way. It says, all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ Jesus. And look at this. And God has given us. Us. Everybody say us. Everybody say me. Point to your neighbor and say you. He's given us this task of reconciling people to him. Now here's what I like to propose. When it comes to being sent, you know, I, li I love to think about the gospel that this is good news, that this is the cure. But in Ephesians or I'm sorry, in 2 Corinthians, Paul says it's a task. And let's be real. It wasn't all roses and, and, uh, for, for Paul. In sharing this gospel, there was a cost. There, it was a task, right? There are things sometimes that God calls us to that he's calling us to sacrifice and die to ourselves of a little bit more for the sake of others. Why? This is what Jesus says, that, a, that a, you know what a real friend is? A real friend is one who lays down his life for others. That that's what a real friend is. And he set the example. And, and so, so there is this. It's not all roses. And yeah, some people may think you're a freak. And you may get rip, uh, raked over the coals on social media. And guess what? And some people are going to call you a hypocrite. Well, guess what? Aren't we all? I mean, the whole cancel culture is just a bunch of hypocrisy. It's pseudo offense. And it's literally, it's coming that I'm, an, I'm a perfect person and I'm going to cancel you because you're not. It, it's hypocritical. The world is hypocritical. Like, don't be afraid of being called a hypocrite. Like, join the gang. Seriously, you're American, you're a hypocrite. For the love. Like is that the worst they can do? And then just don't read comments. Like that's where people get really stupid. The comments to blogs. Comments to articles. I made a mistake and read a couple yesterday. And I had to like, have a come to Jesus moment. Like Jesus I cannot do this. People are stupid. Uh, <laughs> they need you now more than ever. <laughs> Ooh doggy. Uh, anyways but yeah. So, just, just keeping it real. Is that all right? <laughs> um, here's, here's why. is because um, here's, here's the really important thing is that um, when it comes to being sent, it's really important to, you know, th there's different personalities. You know, some of y'all, 
see the best in everybody. It doesn't matter what they do. Like, you just see everything through the rose-colored glasses. And then there's some people that, it, like, like, your glasses are, like, stained and, like, everybody's, like, bad. Like, oh, yeah, they're saying that, but I wonder what is their home life's like. You know, this, that's the type of thought process that your mind goes through with everybody. And, and the thing is, is God can use all of these perspectives. There's going to be some times where you're sharing the good news where it's just like, man, it's like, it's like the word from the Lord just showed up. Like Jesus himself showed up and people just start getting saved. And there's going to be other times where it just feels like it's just, it's like you're shoveling rocks. And it's just, you're never, it's a never ending job. Why is this important? It's because we have to understand that God gave us this task. He gave us this task, that all of us, that this is part of our role. Now, for our last few minutes together, I wanted to take a minute because originally, I actually had a few helpful tips on how to share the gospel with your friends and your coworkers and your neighbors and your spouse and yourself sometimes. Um, so I actually had these um, in the sermon, and but as I was reading, as I was just kind of, I was reading in Mark, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, and, um, and there was a, this passage was really speaking to me, so, so, and it was convicting me and challenging me, so what I wanted to do is just share a little bit of that with you, and then, uh, you know, like, a, a little behind the scenes, so the worship team always, before the message, always, whoever's preaching says, hey, what's your last point, so we know when to come up, all that good stuff, and uh, I, I told Matt today, I said, I don't know, I, honestly, I'm going to read some scripture, and, and then we'll just see where it goes, but, um, but I felt, <laughs> isn't that assuring, but don't worry, we'll get you to Old Country Buffet on time, um, <laughs> with that said, if you have your Bible, we're going to read a decent chunk. We're actually going to read in Mark 11. In Mark 11, um, I love this. And there's some things that stuck out to me that I just wanted to pull out uh, real fast for us. In Mark 11, to give you some context, again, this is where Jesus had the disciples went and got the donkey or the coal. It depends on uh, which, which gospel is telling the story. And and uh, they put Jesus on the donkey, they put the, they put the clothes down, they, they, they put the palm branches down, he's going into Jerusalem, they're yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, the Savior of the world has come, and you know, all that good stuff, I am not singing the song. And, um, but I want, you, I want you to see next what he did when he got to Jerusalem. Because this really stuck out to me, and I, I kind of, I've wrestled with this like all week of like, like it doesn't seem very holy, but I think there may be something there. And so what it says in, in verse um, 11, uh, 10 and 11, I'm, I'm not reading all of it right now, I think. Somewhere in Mark 11, it says that, that when, Jesus, when Jesus and the disciples got to Jerusalem, that he went to the temple. It was the first thing that he did. He went to the temple. But here's the crazy thing. In Mark, it says he looked around carefully because it was late in the afternoon and then they left. And this is very interesting. I know, I've never caught this before. That he looked around carefully. And then they left because it was getting late. And then, this is where we pick up. They, then they go to Bethany, which is where they slept. That's, they must have had an Airbnb there. And in, Mar, in, in, in verse 12, uh, you can join with me in reading. It says, the next morning, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Hey, can I just say, Jesus gets hungry. Jesus can get hangry, as we'll see in just a minute. Do you know it's actually, it's actually possible to be angry and not sin? That there's actually a verse that says, uh, be angry but sin not. So Jesus demonstrated anger a few times. But, but remember, there's this context. He, he had this triumphal moment. Of entering into Beth, uh, a Jerusalem on a, on, a, on a donkey. This is like the king arriving. This is like, it's showtime. This is a week countdown. You know, uh, you guys ever watch the show 24? Where it's like, doo, doo, doo. This is like Jesus. Like the count, the clock is going. Jack Bauer is on the donkey. Uh, Chloe, make sure all the red, li the red lights turn green. I can't do it, Jack. Jack, Jack, Chloe, just do it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? No? Have you watched 24? 
oh, Jesus, everybody stick her hands out right now. We'll pray for them. No, I was like, only one of the best shows for the first, like, ten seasons. And, um, but anyway, so this countdown was on, right? He was, he, I mean, this was an amazing moment. And then all of a sudden, something switched in Jesus. And this is part of what was troubling me a little bit. And, and as I was reading this, it, it seemed like something switched. Something, like, this was supposed to be a happy moment, and it just, like, something ticked him off. Because he went to the temple. So I would actually, because Mark thought it was important to, to, to mention that. So Mark probably knew something. My, my deduction would be that Mark knew that something that Jesus saw in the temple turned something. And then the next morning they wake up. He gets hungry. And then it says, he noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off. So he went over to it to see if he could find any figs. But there were only leaves why? Because it was too early in the season for fruit. Jesus, you know that it's not Fig Newton season. Like, they'll grow, but they're just little buds. They're just, like, and Jesus says, you know what? I don't care. T says to the tree, may no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say it. Now, look at this. This is crazy, right? I mean, like, Jesus, come on. I think Jesus was hangry. I mean, have you ever opened up the chip bag and there's, like, three chips in it? And you're like, oh, kids right i mean like come on let's be real he was fully human fully god so there's something going on here there's a there is a there's a holy dissatisfaction happening in this moment and and then it says if we continue in verse 15 it says when they arrived back in jerusalem i still don't know if jesus ate and by his actions, I think he might have still been hangry. When they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. And he said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of of thieves. So this Palm Sunday, this is what stuck out to me. There's two things, and we could, we could take either of those passages, and we could deduct, we could tear it apart, and, and, every, and there's a lot of good scholarly work that's been put towards that, but I just want to give you a couple skimming off the top for this Palm Sunday as we prepare for Easter next week, prepare our hearts. Two things that stuck out. If you could imagine Jesus is a bridge builder, Jesus is coming with all of his glory. He's, he is coming to establish the beachhead of the kingdom of God on earth. Here he is. Like all of history has waited for this moment. He's the peacemaker. He's the freedom giver. He's the kingdom bringer. He's the savior of the world. And what did he find in the temple? His people just playing church. They were playing church. In another passage, he's telling the Pharisees that you have, you look at the clouds to see and say that it's raining and think you're so smart, but, but you, you, don't, you can't tell the signs of the time. And I think in this moment, what's happened is Jesus, the king of the world, Jesus, the savior of all men, and the church was missing it because the church was just so focused on doing their religious duties that they missed the game changer they missed the peace bringer they missed why they were doing all of this and the reality is is that the temple in Jesus' day was not very evangelistic in fact it was probably more suffocating than it was evangelistic it was more out of duty than it was out of relationship and I believe in this moment that Jesus was coming to the temple and when he, he came into Jerusalem and the crowd, the non-church goers were the ones exclaiming him as the savior of the world and Hosanna and he goes into the temple where obviously he should be the one that is exalted and he should be the one that is celebrated and no one even noticed that he walked into the room because they're so busy playing church. So he said, we got to change this. We got to change this. The second one that stuck out to me 
is that fruit is the demand from heaven to God's family. We can never miss this church. That bearing fruit is a demand. And I think Jesus was using a fig tree as an example in a teaching moment. In another of the gospels, he actually says that uh, when he's explaining to the disciples why he did that, he says, you know, hey, if, if a tree does not bear fruit, they might as well pull it up and burn it. Talking about the demand of the kingdom to bear fruit. And again, remember what I said two weeks ago that, that we're not here for the show. We're here to grow. And sometimes to grow, we got to face some of the hard things in our lives that we've kind of just ignored. And as your pastor, one of your pastors, I want you to grow in this area. That fruit, kingdom expansion fruit, is a demand of the kingdom. And it may look different for different people, and God's going to use you in the wiring that he wires you with. But make no mistake that it is still an expectation of the kingdom for you. It doesn't matter if you're introverted. It doesn't matter if you're extroverted. It doesn't matter if you're highly educated or if you're dumb as a box of rocks, like me. It doesn't matter if you're good looking or if you're ugly. It doesn't matter if you're black or you're white. It doesn't matter if you're rich or you're poor. The fact is, is if you were in God's family, the call of the kingdom is to be sent to bring more people in to God's family. But I want you to see this. This is really important. I, and I, This stuck out to me. It said that the fig tree, it was not season for the fig tree yet. And I think part of what Jesus was saying is, it doesn't matter the excuse. We come up with really good excuses of why we can't bear fruit during this season. And Jesus says, yeah, no, nope, not good enough. We like to make really good excuses. And you know what? And then we gather friends around us that are echo chambers, that, that pat us on the back. And as soon as somebody challenges that excuse, we kind of get our panties in a bunch and go find another church that will pat us on the back and say, you know what, baby? I know you've had a hard day, so you just take six months off. And, and the reality is, and I want you to hear this, of of course, Jesus comes with all grace, of course, but we have to balance this grace with these teachings that he gave that call us to a higher standard. Is that the grace is there, but it's there for a reason to empower us to do what he tells us to do, church. So today, if I could encourage you with anything, I want you to see that people in the Bible that follow Jesus' command to be sent, it looked different ways. Some people were sent back to their village to tell everybody about Jesus. Some people went back to their families at a funeral and told them all about what Jesus did. Some went around the world and died for the gospel and planted churches in other countries. Some, we don't even hear about them, but they had Jesus' ministry had a treasurer. So that means that there had to be people funding I mean, since the fig Newtons weren't on the tree, somebody had to pay for breakfast. The reality is, is there's many different areas and there's different responses to being sent to bring people into God's kingdom, into God's family. But the reality is, is that if I could encourage you with anything, don't just say a prayer, church. Don't just say a prayer and join God's family and then become content with just playing church. Don't, please, if I could beg you with anything, do not just become content with just playing church. That's not what Jesus died on a cross for. Be on mission. Fulfill all five of these purposes for your life. If Pastor Christine and I could, could wish anything, if we could pray anything over you, it would be that you fulfill these five purposes for your life. And this Easter, 
we get to celebrate everything that Jesus came to this earth for. Next Sunday, and trust me, we got some, uh, we got some, uh, I, I sat in on a little bit of practice, worship practice on Sunday, and trust me, y'all, or uh, last week, y'all don't wanna miss what's coming on Easter. I, I'm excited. But listen, wouldn't it be a shame if all of this good news stayed between us? Wouldn't it be a shame if the people who are hurting right now, who are depressed, who are so full of fear and depression, wouldn't it be a shame if they never got to hear that there's good news available and we just kept it in the family and just go, oh, I'm so excited about Easter. What are you wearing? Right? Are we getting an Easter bunny? No. Wouldn't it be a shame if that's all it was? Instead, invite your friends. Bring them. Don't just invite them. Bring them. Have them sit beside you. Like, take the risk of being seen as a hypocrite. Take the risk being seen as the weird one. Be, take a risk and invite. Maybe it's serving somewhere that's needed, but above all things, let's be about the Father's business, church. Let's not become so consumed with just reveling in God's love for ourselves that we miss the whole reason why He loved us is that because he loves the next person just as much. He loves our neighbor just as much. He loves the critic just as much. He loves the agnostic just as much. He loves the Hindu just as much. And he wants all of them in his family. And guess who he's charged to do that? Us. The task is ours, church. Amen? Hey, let's stand. You know, if I'm really honest, I was really nervous because I'm like, this is not a typical Palm Sunday message. You know, usually we like to do the whole Hosanna, you know, Jesus is King, the coming of the King, but I was really impacted by the implications and the way Jesus, like Jesus' first actions on this was was really almost burdensome. You can ask Pastor Christina, I just, I talked about it all week of just like, man, what do I do with this? And so in all of this, just trying to be faithful with what I felt like God was speaking to me and doing in my heart during this. And I hope that you hear in all of this, it's not about being a good Christian or bad Christian. We're not, we're not keeping a, a scorecard. You know, well, how many people did you invite to church? How many people did you witness to? And, but the, but it's, it's out of the grace and the love of God to say, go, feed the church go into all the world, preach the gospel, raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons, church. Like, we get to do this, amen? So why don't we pray? God, thank you, Lord. Whatever you call us to, you equip us for. And today, Lord, I just pray in my obedience to what you were doing in my heart that you prick the hearts and you, you open up the hearts of those who are listening to this, whether they're here in person or those online. I just pray, God, that in this moment, that Holy Spirit, that in all of your love and mercy, not condemnation, don't confuse conviction for condemnation. When the Holy Spirit speaks, he convicts. He doesn't condemn because there's no condemnation in Christ. But in this moment, God, would you just show us in the areas that we've kind of lived for ourselves to the point where there's no margin to be sent. <laughs> Whether we're so busy that we don't see the need that smacks us right across the face or we're, we spend all our money on ourselves that we can't bless those who need it in the moment that we... You may even be calling us to go overseas. You may be calling us to... to do something big for you, you start a ministry and we just kind of let our fear and our excuses hold us back. Today, God, I just, would we respond to that and give it over to you, Lord? Say, God, I'm yours. I'm yours, God, a living sacrifice. Do with me as you please. In Jesus' name. Amen.